G'day podcasters, welcome back to season four of True Blue Conversations. I just want to give a shout out to our show sponsor, 25.4 Coffee, for troopers, by troopers. And this February, they are giving away a year's free subscription of either their Sabri or Trooper Beans. That's 26 bags of 250 grams coffee. All you have to do is subscribe to their newsletter on their website, www.254.com.au. For all your coffee needs, head to www.254.com.au. G'day. Welcome to True Blue Conversations. I'm Adam Bloom. Today's special guest is former Air Vice Marshal retired John Quaid. John served in the RAAF for 28 years as an FA-18 pilot and is also the author of Viking Boys. John has joined us today to talk about his career in the ADF and his life after service. Hi, John. Thanks for joining us on the show. G'day, Adam. Thanks for having me. No, it's an absolute honour and a privilege to have you on the show. So, John, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as a young fella and what made you look to have an interest in the military and, and flying as a young fella? Um, yeah, sure, Adam. I, look, I just, as a kid, I just loved aviation. Um, I had... Uh, I suppose it was always military aviation, so it wasn't just aviation in general. And I had I had an uncle who had served with Bomber Command in the Second World War, and for, fortunately, my uncle Ron was um, he was he was late to the war, which meant he survived it. Because uh, I think most of the fellows that served in Bomber Command, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, there was a tremendous loss rate in that particular endeavour. Yeah, but my Uncle Ron, he'd recognised my interest in aviation and he steered me uh, towards the Air Training Corps that I had known nothing about. I suppose, uh, you know, the the reason why an uncle should have been so influential in my life was the fact that my father had died when I was quite young. And so Uncle Ron had steered me, he recognised that I was interested and he he steered me to the Air Training Corps. And so I had a, a, a very early introduction to... Um, military aviation through the Air Training Corps, which was then and probably still is a wonderful organisation, particularly wonderful in my experience because I was awarded a flying scholarship. And so I had had the the privilege, I guess, of um, uh, the taxpayer paying through this scholarship for me to get my private pilot's licence when I was about 17 years old. So that's really where it came from. So for you, what was what was school like? Were you were you good at school, and and obviously setting your sights on joining the air force as a pilot? What what was school like for you? Yeah, you might think. Hey, um, I, I had uh, my awareness wasn't all that brilliant because I had only recognised that the RAF Academy was the way you joined the air force, which meant pretty good scores in maths and science to be able to enter a science degree, as it was at the time. Uh, with the academy, and I kind of lost um, direction a bit, probably at, you know when I was about in uh, f- fourth form into my senior years. Uh, and, and to, in all honesty, I was probably a bit of a rat bag. I was more interested in being the class clown than I was in doing any serious endeavour. So I actually ended up coming out of my secondary years with uh, nothing like the scores that I would have needed to uh, have a successful application to the academy. So I didn't bother. Uh, by that stage, I was had shoulder length hair and I was playing drums in a rock band, so it kind of didn't matter. <laughs> and it wasn't until uh, a bit later I was um, uh, much to my wife's surprise. So I I, I had uh, left school, gone on and done other things, and got married in the meanwhile. Uh, before I saw an ad in the paper, and it was for direct entrant air crew. And there was a picture of a P3 in the ad, and I thought, I, I remember now. That's what I was going to do, because uh, my, you know, my fabulous career as an international rock sensation hadn't actually taken off, <laughs> and um, and so yeah, I, uh, I applied to join, and I didn't get in on uh, my first application. I, well, I did, but not not. Let me explain. 
what I actually got was a uh, thanks but no thanks letter, uh, but we're putting you on the reserve list. Is, is that okay? Uh, well, sure, yeah, no problem. I still, what I really wanted to be was a pilot. Uh, and yeah, I got one of those, uh, I got a telegram actually, as you used to get in those days saying, stop, stop, you know, hey, <laughs> turn up tomorrow, we'll have you. And uh, so off I went. And like I say, much to my wife's surprise, because she thought she'd married a drummer in a rock band, not not, <laughs> not a pilot in the Air Force. Uh, and the rest, as I say, is history. Yeah. So just going back for a sec, you, you, you said you lost your father very early. So do you think in that sense, was that a... Did you sort of lack a bit of direction when you when you said you you went off in yeah. fourth form and and then yeah. going into was that was that a bit of a you, you just sort of lacked that father figure in yeah. your life at that point? I, I think so. Uh, of course, it's not until you have kids of your own that you start to put it together. But yeah, for sure, um, I think that's exactly the case. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's precisely it, you know, so, um, you know, just faffing around at school and more interested in being an idiot than uh, cracking on with my studies because I actually believe I actually, you know, I'm reasonably smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I hadn't figured it out at that time. So, yeah, that, you're right. And so you joined the Air Force in 1980. Can you share with us some of your experiences of pilot training and what did you have to learn about yourself? Um. Mm, yeah, um, you've caught me with that second aspect. I, I, I guess what I learned about myself was that I had an affinity for it. And it was the same affinity that I'd had as a kid in the Air Training Corps. I, I'd, I'd love my time in the Air Training Corps. And I sort of mentioned, you know, sort of a little bit flippantly getting the flying scholarship. Well, I bloody earned that uh, in that I was a cadet under officer and I was, um, you know, a very gung-ho gung and polished little cadet, you know, before I started growing my hair and getting distracted and whatnot. Um, but, yeah, that, there, was an, there was a big element of me in that. And I guess, too, the, um, uh, the notion of the Air Force as a brotherhood and an organisation, you know, in talking about the uh, uh, the impact of the loss of my dad had had on me, yeah, it's like perhaps I was responding very positively to that uh, the structure of a military organisation and the uh, you know the sense of common endeavour. So uh, I, I took to it very well, um, and I guess what I learned about myself was. Um, uh, and it wasn't really a surprise, but the the fact that I could do this um, was great. And and I actually think there's some, you know, I sort of describe it as that way, and I think I always would. It's not a, I, I don't, I've never felt a sense of criticism for someone who's tried and failed on pilot training, uh, whether that be basic pilots course or even the more advanced stuff that you can get into in the Air Force. Because the, the Air Force has this, kind of unnatural expectation that you'll just continue to progress at the rate they want you to progress. Um, and if you don't, they will fail you. And so um, our uh, pilots course had a, like a 50% loss rate. And so people were going, you know, every day people were getting scrubbed. Um, in fact, Queen's song, Another One Bites the Dust, was uh, <laughs> was in the charts at the time. And it sort of became the course theme song. Bloody hell, the other one's gone. Um, so you, you kind of got used to that and and... Um, there was never any criticism levelled at that. You either could do it or you couldn't do it, is my belief. Um, and I was very uh, fortunate to find that I could do it. So in that sense, being with the the cohort that you're with, like the, the guys around you, did that form a bit of a tight bond as you you guys were, you know, like as you said, the, the attrition rate was pretty high. Yeah. So did you, did you come together as, as a tight-knit group that, that actually got through? Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's interesting, you know, because it was um, a, a mixture of that and fierce competition uh, in some respects. Well, uh, no, not so much fierce competition. I think I'll correct myself there and say, yes, we came together as a group, but it wasn't a group endeavour. It was very much an individual endeavour. This was each person's own personal struggle to get out the other end of this training. And yeah, it kind of helped that you were all doing it together, but your mates could not help get you through. Um, I guess they could help you with study sessions and that sort of stuff when we had exams coming up, but ultimately it was up to you as an individual to pass this bloody course. 
So, and most people would think, John, that you set your sights on, you know, being like the tough, you know, setting sights on being a pilot is, you know, some people, like some people go, I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to be this or... So for you, like, can you explain to us, like, you've got to study, like, so you've got to study physics, you've got to study... So can you you give us a little bit of what, and as you said, you, you wandered away from the study that... You, so did you have to knuckle down to really like to become to achieve that dream of becoming a pilot? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, but it was very natural. Uh, the beauty about uh, entering the Air Force as a direct entrant, uh, which I don't know whether I mentioned that, but I did not go to the RAF Academy, uh, so I did not do a science degree. But by entering as a direct entrant meant that the academics that were involved, and by the way, I took the academic prize on my pilot's course, <laughs> which I'm very proud of, um, but the, the academics that were involved were totally uh, related to flying. So this was the stuff that you needed to know to be a pilot. So if you're a kid that's always wanted to fly, this was just, you know, you just ate that stuff up because it was just it was just the interesting stuff. Some of, you know, I guess some of the meteorology wasn't that interesting, you know, but but you ate it up. And so, you know, basically being um, uh, so attuned to uh, what I had always wanted to do, uh, felt that I would love doing, and when I started doing it, realised I did love doing this. This was just brilliant. Um, yeah, and, and I would tell anyone, and I'll tell you if you ask me, I don't think I've ever worked a day in my life. You know, it's just been fun from the moment I stepped in the door. I mean, hard perhaps, but certainly been fun. Um, so yeah, the academics were, um, I suppose, challenging, but but. Me personally, I was always up for the challenge because the thirst was there. I needed to know this stuff, you know, and so I just loved it. So ex- like, explain to me this. Like, so, uh, You've just mentioned it and I'll uh, go into more detail. People say that when you find your true calling and, and, you know, being in the air, you just you feel as one with – and I know this from being an ex-machine um, operator that – you become accustomed to how your machine feels, and and so for you, you were people say I was born to fly, and and it just became it just became who I was, and so when you're up in the air flying, did did you just feel at home? Um, n- not so much on pilot's course. <laughs> the the reason being is because of that uh, rate of advance in training that I described that you had to you know stay on board with, uh, and very very easy to drop off the rate. Um, you were always <laughs> you were always a little unnerved by the experience, right? Because it was always challenging, so you never really got time uh, to reinforce the skills that you were learning to the point where you were comfortable with them. And and to be honest, that did not happen until um, it didn't really happen for me until I was flying Mirage 3 aircraft. So this is once I'd graduated and it was actually I'd been through this my second operational conversion before I ended up on that aircraft. But it was like uh, it wasn't until I had a few hundred hours on a type of aircraft before I actually began to feel, before the music started playing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I started to be feel, you know feeling at one with the aircraft. Um, so you didn't get that, um, unfortunately. You know, it, you didn't get that with the training aircraft you're flying. Not that I was that interested in forming a close relationship with a CT4, but I'm sure the Mackie would have been a lovely aircraft to be, you know to feel very competent in. And so you never got to feel very competent because that was the whole point. You know, you had to keep progressing. So, as a as a graduate from the RAAF's Top Gun training course, can you explain the history and purpose of the training school, and how did you get selected for the Top Gun program? Yeah, who knows? Um, <laughs> that's because I was excellent at them. <laughs> Modesty is no. <laughs> right, it. the important part of the fighter pilot attribute. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's true. So that happened. Um, 
So I graduated off my pilot's course. I flew Canberra's for a little bit that I don't talk about a whole lot, um, not only because it was not of great consequence. I wasn't there very long. Uh, then when Canberra's were going out of service, I was posted to fly fighters. So I uh, flew, as I mentioned, Mirage's, and I was fortunate enough to be selected for fighter combat instructor's course at the end of my first tour on Mirage's. So I was still a relatively junior fellow. I was a flying officer in rank um, and uh, not experienced as you would normally expect. Um, you know, Typically, I think the course would have preferred a uh, candidate to have two tours under their belt before they would be sent off to do FCI course. But I think the, the secret ingredient that I had wasn't actually my excellence as a pilot. It was the fact that I was old. I Because I'd been off playing drums and whatnot, when I joined the Air Force, I was actually 25. And so... Um, that's being, that's being old. Well, it is. Oh, yeah, it was old. Yeah, it was absolutely old. And, yeah, because most there were, we had teenagers, you know, there were 18-year-olds. <laughs> so I was old. Um, and... Um, I'd consistently get on my officer evaluation reports comments like, you know, um, uh, John is very mature for his rank. Well, yeah, I was because I was old. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, but I think that maturity probably marked me as someone that they could take a risk on to go and do uh, FCI course, which was, now to get to your point, the FCI course was a um, it's kind of brilliant idea, but what, what the in the... Um, uh, you know, this was a course that started in the fighter community. It's since spread to other areas in the Air Force, which is probably a good thing. Um, but what it was 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 the idea of um, taking a a select few uh, of your community and giving them a like a, uh, a tertiary level uh, training program that would really test and expand them, um, and so it would develop a uh, in these people a cabal, if you like, of um, uh, experience, talent, skill, knowledge, that sort of stuff uh, that could then go back into the organisation and infiltrate back into the organisation. And so each squadron uh, had and still has a position in the squadron for, the, for a fighter combat instructor. So this is not particularly a flying instructor in the, in the sense of that word, but this is the person whose responsibility is to assist his commanding officer in the tactical development of the squadron, right? So a re really interesting role uh, and uh, one that you find that uh, most, uh, you know, throw a line, I guess, but m most fighter pilots would aspire to uh, achieve the FCI qualification and, and, of course, not everyone can do it. And to be honest, it's really... it's there's there's probably an element of timing and good luck uh, that that goes with getting selected to do it you know the moons have to align on your where you're actually at with your career and all that sort of stuff so I, yeah i had moon alignment and i ended up doing the the last mirage fighter combat instructor course but i was you know now i'm wearing the patch so that meant i then you know went into uh roles with the hornet when the hornet came along as a hornet fci so i have to ask but is the the RAAF Top Gun training school like what we see in the in the movie, or is there less volleyball and singing around pianos? <laughs> um, yeah, much less volleyball, no singing around pianos, <laughs> no, none at all. In fact, I, in fact, I remember a little anecdote. There is uh, one of my mates who was doing FCI course at the same time. He was living in Raymond Terrace, coming and going at all sorts of stupid hours because you worked really long hours, and it was just uh, it was it was hard work, a really hard slog to get through this course. And um, his next door neighbour had been watching. Kevin with some interest coming and going, you know, and, and eventually curiosity got the better of him and said, what the hell are you doing, mate? I, you know, see you go at, you know, before the sun comes up and you're not home by night and all that sort of stuff. Kevin says quite proudly, I'm doing fighter combat instructors course, right? <laughs> and so the neighbour says to him, oh, that's great, mate. What's that mean? Uh, does that mean, does that mean you're getting promoted? Uh, uh, no, says Kevin. Uh, does that mean you're going to get more pay? Uh, no, says Kevin. And so it's like, what the hell are you doing it for? Um, so, yeah, it was um, – you, you're doing it for other reasons. You're doing it because of, um, I guess, the professional challenge and the and there's a, there's a lot of street cred that comes with the patch, you know. So if you're successful on FCI course, there's good jobs that come your way at the end of having done it. 
But more, more, more than that, it's probably the fact that you are lucky enough to wear the patch. So you're carrying the the charge, if you like, of the of the skill set or whatnot within the organisation. That really good for the ego. So because it's it's the best of the best, isn't it? Going up against each other is that is that what it is, or is it? No, nah, not really. No, I, I'd like to say yes, but it's not. It's more. Um, you know, some of the I, I'm not sure how they do it these days, and you know. Yeah, things that I went on and subsequently did, uh, you know, in the command chain and also in, you know, airworthiness and safety and that sort of stuff. I look back on this and go, God damn, that course was just stupid. Um, because we would, um, the course was deliberately designed to push you beyond your own limits so you could understand that and you could then, um, you could take that experience back to a squadron and so you could recognise when you when what you were asking people to do was starting to get a bit dangerous and a bit silly. Um, and I'm not so sure that should be taught by experience. <laughs> but it was, you know. So it was, um, yeah, I can remember doing do this crazy night, story, night, night sortie up at Evans Head Range, going, going round, round and and... and trying to get bombs off in this crappy weather and whatnot and got back and sort of the, then the staff sort of had this sheepish grin and thought, yeah, we didn't think you'd be, succeed in that mission. It's like, well, what the hell are we doing it for? You know? um, so it wasn't – it was more – so it wasn't a, uh, you know, fighting with each other to determine who was the best. So it's not got that element that you see in the Tom Cruise yeah. movies at all. Um, it's more working collectively to um, – uh, you know, basically survive something that's really difficult and then take that experience with you into life. So for you, did you learn – so obviously you said that you you were pushed beyond the capabilities that you thought you had at the time. Yeah. So did you take away that you can – and I, I've since learned this myself – that we can push ourselves we're, – we're more capable of th- things than we think we are. And, and so did you take away – a sense of being that I can actually do a lot more than yeah. I thought I could do. Yeah, I, yeah, I surprised myself. Yeah, for sure, in in things that I'd succeeded at. Yeah, of course, you you don't let on that in the debrief. <laughs> <laughs> when you're having a quiet moment at home, yeah, a little smile comes across your face. Yeah, I did that. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Oh, I, absolutely. There's there's things that you, you know, there's there's things that you do and and you look at you, and like I said to you before we started the podcast was you know there's things that I like meeting you and other other veterans that I've met through the podcast. Yeah. It's yeah. You know, you, you do sit back and and sometimes quietly reflect and go, yeah, I did that. Like it's yeah, yeah, which which takes me back to what we were talking about right at the start. You know, um, so you think about a um, an organisation that um, you yeah, know provides you the mateship and direction, all that sort of stuff, but it also is actually you know at proactively encouraging you to be a better you. You know, um, that's that's well, why. Um, I, I believe it's like one of the reasons why uh, military veterans continue to have this lifelong passion for their service because of what they experienced. Absolutely. No, it's a good good point you touch on. So you mentioned that you went to the FA-18 Hornets, but many people might not remember, but the RAAF used to operate the French... And the, Get, get me if I'm wrong here. The, the das, Dassault, uh, yeah. I think I've said that wrong. Um, yeah, I'm going to let you yeah. go. <laughs> Keep digging. The, um, the, the, is it? Let me yeah, I'll let put you, you out of your misery. Thank you, thank yeah, the you. Dassault yeah. was the aircraft thank manufacturer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the you. Mirage 3 And uh, you know, now I'm thinking, you know, many people may not remember in comments like that. It's like, I really am getting old, aren't I? <laughs> so can you, can you share with us um, your thoughts on the capabilities oh, right. and perhaps share your unique experience with this fighter <laughs> near Darwin uh, one day in 1985. Yeah, right. I know what you're getting at. So, um, yeah, I ejected out of a mirage in Darwin uh, in 1985. Um, uh, the aircraft had suffered a compressor stall uh, in the circuit, which is, in fact, it was worse than that. It was turning base to land. So it was um, right at the... Um, 
uh, right at the point you probably really wouldn't want an engine failure. So a compressor stall is just a disruption to the flow of air through the compressor of the jet engine. Uh, basically meant I had no thrust. Um, so I had very little uh, opportunity in terms of the potential of where I was and what I was doing to be actually able to recover that, to clear the stall and restart the engine. That sort of stuff probably wasn't going to happen. Um, yeah, I basically gave it just a quick attempt by you know manipulating the throttle rolled the wings level and ejected um so that was <laughs> it, it, it was one of those things you know people ask how did that feel well to be honest couldn't get the smile off my face for about a week you know and it was, <laughs> it, was it was not because it was such good fun it was because i'd done it um so the idea you know you all fighter pilots would say this, and if they don't, they're probably lying. You know, you're very conscious of the fact that you're sitting on uh, a massive explosive charge, you know, when you every time you strap into the jet. And the notion of, you know, I might have to use an ejection seat one day is not something that anyone, any of us relish, right? And so, um, and, and I guess the other thing that I was conscious of was that the, um, uh, a, as you do in, in sort of uh, training and preparation and whatnot, you read other people's stories, and I'd read uh, a lot of, of a lot of accidents that that were theoretically survivable if only the pilot had ejected in time. And I can understand why that might happen, um, because uh, you know, if you especially if you feel that you may have done something wrong and you're trying to solve that problem, you could stick around in the aircraft too long trying to solve that problem to the point where you actually kill yourself because you'd failed to take an ejection decision. That's what the smile on my face was all about, the fact that I'd been in that situation and I'd made a very uh, quick quick and, it, as it turned out, correct decision to initiate the ejection and it all worked like a charm. I got one swing in the chute, thanks very much. So, you know, it was all very – yeah, it was, it was on the edges, on the margins, but it was survivable and, and, and I'd done it. And I think you, like, I guess in a sense, John, now hindsight's a wonderful thing and like you said, it's, it, you made the right call. But that's, that's, that's a, you know, that's a near-death experience and, and I guess – in a sense for you, is it the the quick thinking that you made that decision to eject that day that you're still here now? Do you, have you have you often thought about that day? And, and uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I have. Um, I don't dwell on it. In fact, I don't even remember the date. I have one of the guys in the squadron who had to do a lot of paperwork. He, he tends to remember it for the paperwork and he'll, he'll send me an email to remind me. Um, um, look, it was more... It's. It was uh, very. I was very much a product of my training, uh, and so I don't tell the story frequently. But when I have, uh, like I have found myself speaking to junior guys on graduation courses and the like, uh, just trying to um, give them some context as to why um, the Air Force is so anal about. Uh, uh, checks and procedures training and emergency handling and the like it's because when I was in that situation I, I never it I never thought I was saving my life or making you know life or death decisions I was just handling an emergency and I just did everything as per my training and it worked fine end of story it's yeah. it's something that you touch on there is training because I know being in the fire brigade we train regularly too and it's the it's the muscle memory of you know and 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 it's and you speak to any veteran and they say the same thing my training got me through you know my training and that's why same as what we do with our new recruits that come through we say you get get ready to be do a lot of training because when it comes to that critical moment it's the it's the muscle memory of well i know what i've got to do you just you just do it and and, yeah. and it's a key point that you touch on that i think any young person listening that can go well okay that's that's why they do so much training that's is right. you, you referred to your training and, and it's at the critical moment the muscle memory of you know like we we do it too we roll and bowl hoses and people get they get so annoyed with rolling and bowling of, of, you know, and they go, why are we doing this again? And it's, well, at the critical moment when we've got a house under threat, we, it's just a, let's go. It's, 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 a, it's a quick, it's not a fumble. It's a, 
quick bang within within a minute you've got water and you're defending the house and same thing for you it's the training you fall back to your training and it's and i think it's a key point that you touch on that is that people can take away that's why the military train that's why the police train ambulance that's you fall back to your training and so the difference between the two when you like you, you talk about the hornet and you talk about the the incident that happened in what are the different capabilities in two, the two oh, jets? Two oh, the two, jets. yeah, okay. Um, the Mirage was a um, was probably a product of the fifties, I'm guessing, in terms of design era. But it was a, an interceptor, so it was a it was it, for those of the listeners that aren't <laughs> old enough to remember the Mirage three. Adam, let me explain that it was a very pointy aircraft, you know, with a delta shaped wing and whatnot really fast machine, uh, twice the speed of sound kind of uh, interceptor aircraft, but not so good for turning. You know, this was a straight line aircraft that was designed, as I say, back in the 50s to be an interceptor. You know, the old whole idea being get up airborne quick, travel very fast to where uh, the large Russian uh, nuclear weapons launching vehicle might be, shoot it down and, you know, come back home for lunch or, you know, for champagne or whatever the French might have given they designed the thing. Uh, whereas the uh, Hornet is not completely different but a lot different. Um, it, uh, it Its designation was FA-18, um, FA, uh, F for fighter, A for attack. So this was an aircraft that was equally comfortable uh, in uh, fighter roles as it was in attack or strike roles, so dropping weapons. Um, it was anyone who's seen the classic Hornet at an air show would tell you incredibly manoeuvrable. Um, and, um, yeah, know, one uh, other things was a key difference between the Mirage and the F-18, I believe, was it had two engines. Um, and so a lot of the, um, uh, I don't know, probably the feeling of, um, you know, riding a wild machine that you might have had flying the Mirage was now gone with the comfort of um, design and capability of the F-18. It just felt a lot better to fly, you know, in terms of which aircraft would I prefer to go to war in, uh, without a doubt, the Hornet, thanks very much. Uh, which aircraft did I feel more manly in and better looking in? Definitely the Mirage. <laughs> so for you, was it hard to, like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, and, and I've just thought about this. So, like, you talk about the Mirage and you talk about the you, you talk about the FA-18. Was it hard to learn the FA-18 oh. compared to the, Mira- the Mirage? Or was it... Um. Were they different in the cap- – obviously, they had different capabilities yeah. and everything. But for you, was it hard to learn a new tool? Like, obviously, it's it's a new – it's right, a new yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, you know, good question. Yeah, good question. Uh, n- no, it's not hard, but but yes, you had to learn. You know, you had things to learn. Um, I, I love the design of the classic Hornet because I can remember going through the ground school, which in those days we'd progressed. We're now doing it, you know, at a computer terminal um, – and you 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 were being you paced through you know information that was being drip fed to you but every time you hit next on the, on the keyboard <laughs> get more information and you'd be you'd be reading stuff and going gee um, oh that's really clever wouldn't it be good if you if it also did that and you hit next oh it does do that yeah so every everything was very much designed around um, the pilot's needs and wants and so coming into that training having been an experienced fighter pilot on the Mirage. Um, it was it was a uh, revelation, I guess, to see how well designed the Hornet was. Um, so yeah, there was a uh, yes, there was a bit of there was a learning curve required to get there. The the thing that you put into my head when you asked the question though was, I was surprised but not surprised uh, by the number of my contemporaries that took the transition from Mirage to Hornet as being a good decision point for leaving the Air Force. And at the time, the uh, major airlines were heavily recruiting, so Qantas, Cathay Pacific and the like. And so a lot of my mates, my contemporaries of that era, uh, left uh, because they could, you know, do I stick around and go back to being a uh, bog rat, you know, being a junior uh, F-18 pilot where when I used to be, you know, a senior Mirage pilot, or am I off? You know, is this the time to leave? And a lot did choose to leave. And so... 
key point you touch on, what made you stay at that point? Like, because you you could have had the opportunity to do the same yeah, thing. Like the same yeah, thing. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, um, and uh, it's not that I didn't think about it. I did, um, but I was never enamoured by the idea. And to be honest, the um, the reason I stuck around, um, in fact, this reason, this this reason is the the valid reason throughout my career. It's because I was having fun. Uh, I was really enjoying what I was doing at the time and what I could see was coming next. Um, there were certainly some things that I could see on the horizon that I might not want to do, but the Air Force just kept giving me good deals and so I just hung around because it was just... So in 1987, you completed your F-18 Hornet conversion training and you su- subsequently served with number two operational conversion unit, number 77 squadron and number... 75 squadron what was that like for you um well i guess you know that was the that was the bulk of my um uh, trade time if you like you know in terms of me developing the art of being a fighter pilot i had um we tend to you know pilots always do this they talk about how many hours they've flown you know so i had um uh, something like uh, 700 hours in the Mirage, but about 1,500, perhaps a bit more, in the Hornet. So most of my time as a fighter pilot was, was spent flying the classic Hornet. So those years that you talk about, that's 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 the bulk of my you know, getting to be good at what I was doing time. Um, so through that period, you know, a lot of uh, opportunities for international exercises, deployments, that sort of stuff, um, uh, with me going through, you know, bouncing between roles with units uh, that you mentioned. Yeah. So you became a fighter combat instructor with in excess of 2,000 hour, hours fighter experience. Yeah. Was becoming an instructor part of the plan and how did you find this new role? Um, well, first, Adam, you presume, you presume there was a plan. <laughs> 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 there, there wasn't really. Um, I, my, my plan did not. My, so my big Air Force career plan did not go far beyond wanting to be a pilot in the Air Force. You know, so uh, from once I'd achieved that, it was let's just take each day as it comes. Um, uh, so it wasn't really planned. Um, and you know, the the instructor part. Uh, I think I've sort of hinted that the. Uh, the role of the fighter combat instructor, which was the version of instructor that I became, uh, was less the schoolhouse type instruction and more the on the job mentoring and helping type instruction that probably I would have done whether I was wearing the patch or not, you know. Um, so it wasn't, um, it's wrong to think of uh, me having to, you know, spend. Uh, uh, time grumpily, you know, uh, in the back, you know, units instructing, you know, the people that were actually heading to the front, you know, it's like, nah, it wasn't really like that. So in, oh, well, from 1996 to 1998, you commanded number 77 squadron. What was the RAAF's role and capabilities during this time and what was a typical day in the life of an Aussie fighter pilot at that point? (laughs) Um, Well, I've been media trained, Adam, so I'm going to choose to not answer the question you asked (laughs) and answer another. Well, because um, the reason I do that is um, a day in the life is a bit difficult. We we tended to think... um, uh, how we approached what was happening in the squadron was much more chunky than that. We tended to think about um, uh, we had an annual flying program, but it was more the six monthly that would control what was going on. And so, a uh, in in within that flying program, uh, we were developing everyone in the squadron was going was going through their own personal development that that was that was controlled. It wasn't just random it was uh, controlled through a categorization scheme and so each individual was slowly advancing by being exposed to you know, new opportunities new, new you know sort of training uh to um uh, basically pr- progress from being category d to category a so now dcba the um the logic of that 
in the early days was as simple as if you're Category D, you can fly the jet, but you can't go to war. If you're Category C, you can lead a pair. If you're Category B, you can lead a four. And if you're Category A, you could lead a squadron or two. Uh, got a lot more nuance than that over time. So there's that going on. Uh, and then the other thing that's happening within the six monthly is you're running through, yes, that cycle of categorization training, but you're also preparing for... Uh, and this is a characteristic of a peacetime air force, which it was at the time, you're preparing for a major exercise. You know, there'll be things that are in the program, like such as a pitch black exercise or a kangaroo exercise, uh, Chiringa, which was the uh, deployments to Singapore or Malaysia, or a major weapons camp coming up, something like that, that was a a feature on the not too far distant horizon that you had to prepare for. So typically, you you know, what was a typical day like? Well, it was like, you know, yesterday we did some, you know, uh, work in preparation for this exercise that's coming up today. We're doing much the same. You know, the next day we're probably doing something similar, but we're slowly, it's slowly getting more complex. So by the time we go uh, to do it, we're capable of employing the squadron where we need to be. So you mentioned that the peacetime we were in a we we're in a in a holding pattern in the late eighties, early nineties. There wasn't there wasn't a lot going on that our military was involved in, and then that would ramp up in the in the years to come. So you, you how do you keep your how do you keep your squadron motivated to to say that you know we're in a we're in a peacetime you know holding pattern, but how do you keep them motivated to to stay in in the RAAF? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it comes through that um, certainly in a fighter squadron came through that um, uh, sense of personal achievement, and now I'm I'm guilty of. Uh, referring to air crew um, and sort of what I'm not doing is acknowledging the challenge of keeping your, uh, you know, the the bulk of the squadron, which is the technical side, um, who are driven by different motivations and, and are experiencing quite a different career to what the fighter pilot is experiencing, but nonetheless are critical to the combat capability of the unit, right? Um, so, it's it is difficult, but I actually think what we would all share was this um, sense of striving for excellence. Um, so a lot of competition between the squadrons, um, certainly a uh, a ridiculous amount of competition, and sometimes unhealthy <laughs> competition to a degree uh, between the tribes. And what I'm particularly referring to in in those days, it was pre air combat group where we were, we, fighter pilots and fighter squadrons and members thereof, were all members of the tactical fighter group. And, you know, they, just ask anyone, the enemy was <laughs> surveillance or strike reconnaissance group, the pigs, right? So, so it was that bloody F-111 community that typically were uh, always the opposing aircraft in inverted commas uh, for any exercises we would do. And the level of um, uh, competition between the tribes was as I say, sometimes unhelpful. Um, so you, you, you had that going on, so the, the strive for excellence. You also had uh, the wanting to uh, uh, demonstrate that you're good um, and, and your squadron is good and capable when, when you do an exercise and the like. And the other thing I think that um, very much kept the skills alive was back to that notion of the fighter combat instructor. The um, I guess this really came home for me was... Um, so I'm, I missed, you know, unfortunately my timing was such that I missed uh, a lot of the preamble stuff. I left my foundation phase as being, as a, being a fighter pilot before our first tickle, just before our first tickle of operational deployment, which really was uh, East Timor when uh, aircraft stood alert uh, from Tyndall in the Northern Territory, ready to support our guys that were going into East Timor and the extraction of Australians and the like, um, and that was that was quickly followed by Slipper, where we de- deployed uh, Hornets to Diego Garcia to provide air defence for that strategic asset, and then shortly after that, uh, we uh, slipped into. Um, Operations Bastille and Falconer, which was the, the essentially, um, uh, 
paraphrase, but it was a deployment of the 75 Squadron essentially to the Middle East uh, to conduct the uh, uh, operations in support of the invasion of Iraq. Um, then, of course, that went on to um, Accra, you know, in more recent years. Um, I was, so as I say, I, that had all, you know, I'd basically finished and so I was off doing more senior senior things. Um, but I came back to be uh, commander of Air Combat Group, as it had stood up by then, uh, at the time that our, uh, that 75 Squadron went off to the Middle East, right? And so there's, that almost was a, a fingers in the ears moment. Fingers in the ears, were, okay, here we go. We're going to find out. Um, so this was an organisation that had been at peace uh, and trying to maintain the rage, maintain the skills, uh, f- basically since the Korean War. Doing nothing, if you like, to think of it that way, in terms of uh, operational uh, tasking. And now we were potentially uh, going to, you know, we were, we were front and centre putting our people into harm's way quite deliberately, uh, and it's like, okay, let's see how this goes. And uh, it was with our our great collective relief that it went all went swimmingly well, all right? <laughs> and so you, know, whew, you wipe the brow. Uh, uh, so why did it go swimmingly well? Um, I think a lot of that had to do with that maintaining the kernel of capability, the K-E-R-N-A-L, no, nothing to do with army ranks, uh, the kernel of capability through the fighter combat instructor. It was also had a lot to do with the amount of exercising that we had done with our major allies, particularly the USAF, but, or US, I guess, in all its forms and glory, uh, but also our other allied uh, air forces that we'd worked with over the years. So you, we kind of knew we, we were in touch with how to do this, uh, and so when we went to do it, it didn't turn out too bad. So you mentioned that y- you we like East Timor, then into Operation Slipper, then Faulkner and and yep. and Iraq invasion. But w- everyone knows John where they were on September 11, 2001, when the World Trade Centers were deliberately attacked. And what did it mean? for you and and obviously the the RAAF and the squadron going forward did you did you think that we would go to we would this would be a war that would go on for as long as it did for 20 years and oh, and no. did you what, what did what did September 11 mean for the RAAF and getting ready in the picking up capabilities to go to war uh, after the attack um Yeah, I guess the um, it's probably wrong to think that probably even any of us in the military were contemplating that, you know, global events with any special insight. I'm trying to think of, you know, my feelings at the time yeah, yeah, in that yeah. it was, um, I think I, we, were as nonplussed as anyone else it, trying to figure out what had just happened. I go, what does that mean? Don't know. Um, Now, then though, when you start to, okay, what does that mean? Don't know. Well, people are talking about uh, going to war, you know, and you're getting that fed to you through the media of the day. Um, Now, you can't help but think, here we go. And um, there's this notion um, that's... uh, uh, that's I've heard expressed as being like uh, a, a member of a football team that that never actually plays a match or never actually makes it to the finals, you know, as in you, you know you're a really good team but you've never actually played anyone to find out whether you can win or not, you know. And so there is this a little bit of a hunger going on there to give it a go and actually test test what you've been doing all these years to see if it works. So uh, while I'm, I don't buy into... Um, any warmongering that might happen in the military, but that professional desire to know what you've actually been investing your life in has been uh, a worthy or a you know a valid pursuit or not is strong, uh, and so we were very keen to uh, to see if it, if we were going to get asked to 
demonstrate our skills. And so, and we're very happy to to do so should we be called upon to do so, to the point where uh, yeah, we're probably thrusting a bit to try and get uh, selected to go. Yeah. So, and and I asked that question because around in Australia too, did you feel, especially being that we'd been in such a peacetime holding pattern, did you feel a sense of like danger and what changed around like defence security around the bases and did did things change in that sense? Um, yeah, I guess they did. Um, uh, there was a a greater sense of reality to what we were doing. Yeah, there was a bit of that, you know. But yeah, you know, equally though, you, you also see a bit of nonsense. You know, it's a bit like. You know, to draw a parallel, I suppose, it's a bit like watching, you know, the government's response to the COVID pandemic, you know, bloody hell, you know, right, really, is that going to help, you know, that sort of making decisions, but not so sure it's the best decision. So there's a little bit of that stuff going on uh, in the military. I guess for me, this this brave new world um, really came home. We I did, I was commander air combat group when we did, uh, op Guardian Two, and Guardian Two was was a Chogham event. Chogham, yep, was a Chogham, and it was held at Coolum uh, in Queensland. And it was the meeting was opened by Queen Elizabeth, and there were heads of state there from a variety of countries. And this was the first major event of its type that was held in Australia since September 11. And the 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 realization had dawned on. Uh, government and the military that we better provide some air defence here because we don't want one of those September 11 attacks going on here. Thank you very much. And so we put armed aircraft uh, for the first time uh, in Australian skies ready to shoot down things that might have been perceived to be a threat. And um, I mean, that was the first time we'd done We've since done it a number of occasions and it still goes on. Uh, but so this was – but it was a – bit of a wake-up moment. The interesting thing that I thought about it was that um, the government realised that you know, normally when stuff's important and you don't want it to go wrong and you're a bit nervous about stuff, you know, the, 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 the tendency is to centralise and hold it very tight. And so you could see that the politicians did not want to let this go. You know, they wanted to be in control and they wanted to be making decisions. But at the same time, they were smart enough that, to realise that they couldn't do that. And even... Um, even defence realised that it couldn't do that and it had to delegate it and put the power of control somewhere. And they put it into myself and Dave Peach. So I was the uh, uh, Joint Task Force Commander and Dave was my deputy and we operated 12-hour shifts uh, in opposition to each other and basically we were on call to uh, be on the radio for any intercept that might have occurred and, and it was our job to authorise deadly force uh, over straight, shoot something down, you know. Um, that was a bit, sort of made you think a bit. Was it, I guess in a sense too, was it a really a busy time at that point? Like looking back now, was it a very, and I'm trying to get the word, like was it a... A tolling? Did it have a toll on on you or? Uh, no, me personally, no. There was a lot going on. That's true, um, but there was, I mean, there was a lot going on just in the fighter community beyond what might have been happening operationally. Um, so, the Hornet fleet was going through uh, the largest midlife upgrade of probably ever undertaken, possibly anywhere ever you know it was it was a huge program that was going on at that time um and so we were uh the place was humming uh in terms of um uh suffering the degree of difficulty to do our job you know with uh stressors that were externally imposed or self-imposed as, as as you might see fit uh to generate capability to go off and do stuff so yeah we were busy um the um, so the first as I mentioned the first thing we did was that slipper depl deployment. It was only four jets to Diego Garcia, and you know in hindsight they really didn't do anything, um, but they were not to know that, and so that was that was a busy time, which was you know quickly followed. I think it was like 
you know, two years at the most later was when um, 75 Squadron went off to the Middle East and um, that was big. That was a big event to, to send whatever that was, a dozen jets or something, in, into the Middle East, essentially a squadron strength. Uh, and they were there for, uh, I think it was a three-month commitment and um, uh, we could have rotated that deployment uh, but, geez, it would have been tight and the impact that would have had on our training back home would have been significant. Um, we didn't. We didn't need to do that. So it only lasted for three months and that uh, that worked out very well. And then what you see out of that learning is uh, the next time we go back to the Middle East, it's for Operation Okra. Uh, the Super Hornets were the first to go, but the Classics then went on a rotational basis and... Um, you know, through that period, we were getting smart. And so it was basically done through a series of half squadron deployments because it had, oh, that went on for two years or more, I think. So you, you mentioned that earlier that you were, the, in 2002, you became the Air Combat Group Director and you were in this role until 2004. What was your role in this command and particularly in relation what was involved in the RAAF combat operations if you can answer it in in Iraq and Afghanistan oh yeah no sure yeah I can um right Uh, let me unpack that a bit for you so in I mentioned the tribal thing that was going on between um tactical fighter group and the strike reconnaissance group so the F-18 community and the F-111 community um in 2001 I got the gig to be the director of the Air Combat Group project. So what this was, was a um, uh, 12 months to figure out how we were going to bring the two tribes together into a single force element group. Uh, So we created Air Combat Group, which put F-111s and Hornets into the same command structure. And to give me the motivation to get that right, uh, I was to be the first commander of the group. And so that's what happened through that period. Uh, that was that was an interesting change management exercise, which I won't bore you with. Um, but but it was ultimately successful because it's how we've uh, configured to fight, and it's actually set us up uh, for the transition to F thirty five, the Joint Strike Fighter. I believe we probably wouldn't have done it as efficiently as we did had we not made that move when we did. Uh, but then, so now our operations, interestingly enough, then um, the. You know, coincidentally, the uh, the creation of Air Combat Group actually saw the realization dawn uh, that that things were moving on in terms of how we operated as an air force and the platforms that we were operating, and that the F one eleven aircraft, as magnificent as it was, was no longer giving us the uh, return on investment. Uh, perhaps deterrence wise that had had done for many years uh, it was be- it was becoming an expensive and a difficult platform to maintain and keep serviceable in a and but in a war fighting context where its relevance was declining all right so it, it shortly went out of service so from about that point on you know the focus is all on classic hornet until we subsequently start getting uh, growlers uh, coming into the orbat and super hornets um, right so stuff in the middle east then the i, I found I, I believe that what happened in um uh, uh falconer which was the invasion of iraq was um if you had to uh, it had to develop a textbook campaign for the use of, of combat power. Um, that was it. Um, because if you look at what the, um, uh, the involvement of our hornets and what they were doing, they started in, the, um, in very much a air superiority type role where they were basically uh, conducting air defence in an air-to-air type posture, which is the classic, if you look at the theory of air power, you know, what do I do first? Well, first I get air superiority, right? So that's what they were That's what they were targeted to do. But within days, um, it was obvious that the Iraqi Air Force was not going to fight that war. And so the Hornets, because they're multi-role, fighter and attack, were able to, you know, with the flick of a switch, basically go from uh, an air-to-air role into a strike or an attack role and so they then went into roles of uh, deliberate strike missions to then, uh, which is, 
you know, a strike mission, to paraphrase, it's like that's stuff that an Air Force can do independent of the other services. Uh, into then uh, battle area interdiction, which is now I'm doing stuff that acknowledges that there's a fight going on on the ground, you know, and it's more closely associated with what's going on in that fight to eventually get to close air support where actually what I'm doing is very involved with what's going on on the ground. And by the way, I better take some notice of where the friendly guys are and so it needs close integration. Well, um, that deployment of Hornets went through each of those roles, which is, you know, again, if you crack open the air power manual, this was just precisely how a war was supposed to be fought, you know, and we did, you know. So that was, it was a really, um, I think it was a um, a very sort of fundamental experience to have, uh, have the fighter community experience that and go through that because, you know, subsequently what's happened with uh, then the redeployment back into theatre for Okra quite a different war that was very much close air support really you know, a little bit occasional strike thrown in uh for two and a half years so quite a different campaign so the role of a fighter pilot has evolved and developed since world war ii particularly with the event of jet fighters what is the main role of fighter pilots whilst on deployment in a modern war zone and is the art of dogfighting still one of the most important roles for a fighter pilot to know? Um, let's start at the end and go backwards. So I, I, it, uh, dogfighting remains a skill, um, but it's not a role. Um, it's just uh, one of the things that you need in your bag of tricks, you know, should you need to employ it. So um, the, you know, things that haven't changed, and I was sort of touching on it, in what I was just talking about, um, the so what is it? What is it that fighters do? You know, and 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 um, they're not the only weapon, but but fighters are the weapon that makes um, the air campaign possible. You know, and the air campaign, as I mentioned, it really does start with this notion of um, a fight for control of the air, whether that be. Uh, to completely destroy your opponent's air force or whether it's, uh, you know, keep them away from what I'm, the area that I want to use for other purposes just for the time that I need them away, you know, and then I'll let them come back or whatever it might be. Um, so that's, what you, you, you can do that. That's, that's um, uh, power projection in the air, if you like, to make the dream come true in terms of, um, it, you know, that uh, air dominance or air superiority. And then when you get that, then you can do other stuff that might happen. You know, so now you can, now you've got the choice of uh, air delivered firepower. So how do I, you know, now it's like um, basically I'm using air platforms to deliver heat blast and frag, you know, and so where do I want to put that heat blast and frag? Well, gee, if I can put it into, you know, his Air Force's hangars, that might be handy for my air superiority thing. You know, that might be a way of achieving that. But I can also start to think about how can I best employ my air power for the overall campaign aim? And that might be, well, I need to employ it in fairly close association with what's going on in the land campaign or it might be what's going on in the maritime campaign and so that type of thinking leads you to a joint campaign and where air fits in so now uh we were t again talking before the podcast you know nothing ever changes you know this is what uh, uh john monash was figuring out in the first world war uh you know the stuff that we saw happening in terms of how to roll out uh, a, a campaign across Europe towards the end of the Second World War, uh, uh, how to um, different, uh, completely different complexion, but how to run a counterinsurgency campaign in Vietnam, for example. You know, so um, the uh, even though the platforms change, the the, the essential underpinning of what I'm trying to do uh, in terms of um, bringing power to bear doesn't change a whole lot. And yeah, by the way. Um, Dogfighting is a shitload of fun, uh, so we need to keep that skill alive. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's real. That's really just the if if all else fails and, and another and, and an enemy aircraft you know, turns up here, you know, it, within visual range, uh, and I'm going to have to fight him. I want to win that fight. So, 
In 2005, on promotion to Air Vice Marshal, you were appointed the RAAF Air Commander, a post you held until 2007. Can you share with us a bit about your time on attachment to the United States Central Command as Director of All Coalition Air Operations in the Middle East Theatre? What was involved in the role and what was the most challenging part of, of your role? And I know that's a big question, but... Um, yeah, no, it's all right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, actually, it might have been before I took over as Air Commander, um, I... I did my my first and my only operational deployment. So I was deployed to uh, the Middle East to be the director of the Combined Air Operations Centre. Uh, the The Air Operations Centre is it's like a machine. Uh, what it really is, it's a big tin shed full of people and computers and radios and stuff. Um, but it's the um, it's the command centre. We are back in the day. You'd see uh, movies and whatnot with people writing backwards on on perspex screens with China Graph pencils and all that sort of stuff. It's like the modern day equivalent of that, if you like. And it's how the um, it's how you can. I, I, in fact, I used to use this on OHP slide. You can imagine, you know, the. Um, the maritime commander, the land commander and the air commander sitting around with the joint force commander and they're sitting around a table with, you know, cigars and beers and stuff and they're thinking about how are we going to fight this war? What are we going to do, you know? Uh, and the, you know, the maritime guy, oh, I can do a bit of this and the, and the land commander, oh, I can do a bit of that. And the air commander says, ah, well, I can do a bit of this, that and that and that, that. right? So now when you take that back into, so when the air component commander leaves the table and goes back, right, now I've got to deliver on what I said I was going to do, he's got to actually create... A, uh, a series of events that meet the promise of what he what he you know what he said he was contributing to the fight. Well, well, how does he do that? Well, he he does it through this air operations center where he can um, you know it's a little bit stylized in terms of setting out his objectives and whatnot, so uh, everyone can be aligned in terms of what he's doing. But eventually, someone has to unpack that and go, you know. Well, hey Adam, this is what I want you to do tomorrow, and John, this is what I want you to do tomorrow, etc. So that the individual tasking of aircraft has to flow, you know, coherently from that little table where the blokes and the cigars are trying to think it, think this problem through. Um, and so uh, it's the Air Operations Centre that does that, and that and they do it by you know putting together an air task order. And it all sounds very uninteresting and boring, but it's a, it's the daily machine that controls um, basically everything that flies. So everything in the theatre that's airborne needs to be, well, there's some exceptions to that, but everything that's in the theatre under the command of the air component commander needs to be put together in this coherent manner. So that's what I was doing. So I was the director of that process. Um, the, um, uh, you know, um, what we were doing, it had a lot of, it had, an interesting mix of a majority of Groundhog Day feel to it. So um, a lot of stuff we were going to do tomorrow was the same sort of stuff that we did today and we'd done the day before. That's fine. So that was the um, the bulk of the work as it, as it sort of was carried out. So it was a bit like shifting the Titanic or whatever. It was very slow moves to steer that ship around. But on top of that, you also wanted – to be as responsive as air power is. You know, I wanted to be able to, if something popped up, I, I needed, you know, an opportunity popped up, I needed to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. If that was a bad guy that needed to be killed right now, I wanted to be able to kill him right now. Um, and so you had that very ponderous activity overlaid by this incredibly dynamic activity and ability to be incredibly dynamic at the top and as the director you would um i would be involved in um you know oversight of the ponderous activity a bit boring watch a bit of cricket on the telly that sort of stuff as the day unfolded uh but then there were the you know like the call in the middle of the night get into the shed right now because shit's going down and we've got this opportunity and we're working up a dynamic target we're just waiting for approvals to come through so the machine was doing its thing so this was not me but you know the the people that worked for me uh were doing their thing and we could get uh, air power and air power effects, you know, in theatre at the right place, right time, precisely, uh, legally, 
Uh, so a lot to think about, um, and we we would that's what we were doing. A um, couple of, I guess, you know, for me, the anecdotes were a bit on the on the lame side, perhaps. But I could, I, you know, we were there. I was in the uh, Kayok when the um, first elections were held in Iraq, and there was a real fear that the um, insurgents would would type would disrupt that. And we were doing like it seems like pretty naff, but we were we put so much air power and so many so many aircraft over Iraq that day that we were, and we were amused by watching journalists on the telly that were talking into their microphone and kept getting interrupted by the sound of airplanes, you know. And it was, but it, that was the point. What we were trying to do was to let the insurgents know that if they tried anything, that the air power was there and was going to sort them out. Um, yeah, really interesting time and really interesting to see uh, and be involved uh, with directing the mass of air capabilities. In fact, because at that stage uh, that I was doing that job, there were no Australian air, no Australian combat aircraft in theatre. So you were so you're working side by side with the US, and what was that like for, yeah. for you? And what did you What did you take away from the way they do and run their operations? Yeah, I was embedded, you know, so for all intents and purposes, I could have been an American. Um, I, I, it's funny, when you, when you have those experiences, when I've, this has happened to me through my career uh, and when I've had experiences similar to that, is what you actually build is an appreciation for your own force. Uh, so I built an appreciation for Australia and the, the, my biggie was uh, the flexibility of the ADF in that because we were um, because we're small, we tend to um, value and accept innovation to a degree that the Yanks can't tolerate. <laughs> no, no disrespect to any of my American colleagues, but um, uh, when you're big, you can afford and now speak specifically about aircraft um, but when you're big you can afford to have you know I'll have an aircraft type to do that I'll have another aircraft type to do this I'll have another aircraft to do that that you know so everything that you might be want to do with an aircraft you've got a specific squadron or a wing or whatever that does that stuff right and so the notion of um, well you know we hang on we don't really need to bring another squadron into theater can't we just get these blokes to do a bit of that on the site oh no 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 john that's not how we do it you know <laughs> so so that you know that it, it, in some respects it, be, uh, it sort of struck me as very being very ponderous um and you see different things you know there's um i was going to get into sort of the notion of um Oh, let me. I was going to talk about uh, perhaps some more cavalier attitude. The other thing I thought that now this is a bit more critical of ourselves, perhaps. But the um, again, when you're big, you can be far more accepting of losses. Um, I was stunned uh, by the um, uh, the lack of concern when uh, when we might throw away a predator or two. You know, so um, a large unmanned aerial vehicle, you know, just what whatever, just, oh, yeah, we lost one of them yesterday. Yeah, oh, lost one. And, and in, our, in the ADF, it's like, hang on, when's the court of inquiry? When's the board going to be convened? You know, that sort of stuff. Whereas, oh, no, 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 life just goes on. I suppose, in a sense too, John, it's a, you look at it and it's, I, I guess, because we're so small... We we have accountability for you know well something's gone wrong well we've just thrown that away and and yeah. it's very different like you're saying yeah, yeah, yeah. being a bigger yeah. oh it's, don't worry about it mate that's you know and and yeah. and I think yeah it's it's a real sense of the would you say and I'm I'm just thinking this out loud a bit of a blasé sort of attitude towards it in yeah, yeah it can be yeah. you know I suppose you could describe it that way it's just different you know it's just different and you know, it's just scales of of operation really um but yeah it's a bit eye-opening when you first see it. it's like oh <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> so in 2008 you made the decision to retire after 28 years of service what made you come to the decision to call time on your career um yeah 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 in fact, one of your first questions, you asked me about joining the ADF and, you know, why I did that. <laughs> to be honest, I didn't. I joined the Air Force, you know, and so what, what 
caused me to call time was that I had, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of reached a culminating point um, in that I, I could have, I suppose I could have, oh, it sounds a bit dismissive, I could have stuck around uh, and I was, at the time I was doing uh, an important and rewarding joint job and I could have stayed in that job and there would have been other jobs but they were more likely to have been joint jobs than they were blue jobs and actually I was more interested in doing the blue stuff. <laughs> So we we can't take the we can't take the uh, RAAF out of you, mate. You you you, you blue you you bleed blue. <laughs> yeah, that's a bloody air training course fault. You know they shouldn't have given me that flying scholarship. <laughs> so for you, and I, I say this, leaving the leaving the air force was it a hard decision? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yes and no. It was it, to my mind, it was very. Uh, it was just the logical thing to do, so um, that made sense. But it was a wrench, you know. When it when it came to actually doing it, it was a wrench. Um, more than just um, more than just for me, I'd um, let me reveal a little of my sensitive side. You know, I um, <laughs> I had failed to recognise how much of a wrench this would be for my wife Kim, and uh, it took me. Because I'm, you know, a Luddite buddy, masculine buddy, <laughs> whatever. whatever. Um, it took, I don't know, some time before, I, you know, that dawned on me that it was not all about me and that this actually represented a significant change in lifestyle. You know, for example, we're sitting in our kitchen today and we've been here since I left the Air Force. We've lived here. Um, that is like that that's a ridiculously long time when you look back at my career for us to be in the one house you know we we used to shift house every couple of years you know and to so it's a significant lifestyle change for us to put down roots and settle in one place and um yeah so it's had a it had a required a, a large adjustment for all of us for family something that um i think really uh softened that was that I didn't quite let it go. I'm actually still a member of the Air Force Reserve and I still uh, draw, you know, money out of the system for work that I do uh, every now and then. And so I've, that has, that's that been beautiful because that's meant... So meant for many years I stayed in touch with um, uh, airworthiness boards and, I, and let's not go into that because that's a big story. Um, but I still do a bit of work with um, Defence Honours and Awards um, and a big chunk of my writing now is done for RAF History and Heritage, which is fabulous. So for you, and as you just mentioned, so was there a bit of a period for you, John, where you sort of lost your sense of purpose or was you didn't have that sort of... You, 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 some veterans struggle once they leave, but did, for you, you didn't have that? Um uh, yes and no. So no, I didn't because I was um, I was snapped up pretty quickly. I was I was offered a job with uh, BAE Systems, uh, a general manager's position, which was really really terrific of them to um, uh, sort of consider me for that appointment. Um, and so I worked for a um, a contractor for BAE. It was probably BAE for about eight years, I think. Um, and and but I had done that. You know, I had a sense of nervousness as, as I was leaving the air force, and it was like it was. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to survive. Was was which was ridiculous looking back on it because their pension entitlements aren't too shabby, you know. So I was never going to starve, but I wasn't sure about that, you know. <laughs> and so getting a getting a job was good, uh, and that actually helped me. Um, and but vastly different being uh, working for a defence contractor working back against defence as your main customer. And i got to tell you, defence is a shit of a customer. You know, really difficult to work against, or I found it so um, anyway. And so it took a while for the novelty of that to wear off, like I say, about eight years. But that actually helped the, the transition a lot. So you, you recently mentioned that you do a bit for the defence and honours and awards. And... Given the recent successful campaign that saw Teddy Sheehan receive a posthumous VC, yeah. can you share with us some of the story of your appointment to the Defence and Honours Award Tribunal and the consideration for a VC for James Hawkwill? 
I can. Um, so uh, I've got a habit of doing this. I actually saw an ad in a paper for the uh, Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal and um, thought I wouldn't mind doing that and, and made application and I got the job. Um, you can only be a member of the tribunal for two terms, which is a total of six years. So I've, I've now done that and so I'm no longer on your bike. I'm out of there. Um, but I uh, absolutely love that experience. What um, what you, you may or may not realise is and a little bit as the name suggests. So it's the Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal, but it's not its not a tribunal that's owned by defence. So the defence in the title does not mean it's a defence-owned thing. It's an independent tribunal that considers defence honours and awards. And the defence honours and awards are the service awards and the um, gallantry awards and campaign awards. Um I've called them all awards there. The uh, more technically correct term is to divide them into honours and awards. Um, and so what it means is if you, uh, Adam, believe that you were entitled to a particular campaign, ribbon or the like, and that you haven't got, you can apply to Defence to be awarded that. If Defence says no, bugger off, you have a right of appeal and that's where you would appeal before the tribunal. And because the entire suite is open to that process, we are, Australia is quite unique, I believe, in providing access for um, individuals to apply for, um, and when we talk about a VC, obviously, gallantry recognition. And long story, but that's uh, you know how Sheehan uh, came before the tribunal and the tribunal had recommended that Sheehan be awarded the Victoria Cross. Um, the Hakewell story, which was the subject of Viking Boys, which is the book you mentioned right back at the start, which is how we came to be talking. Um, uh, so James Hakewell was the subject of an application that had been made by um, Ken Wright, who was the mayor, ex-mayor of Mildura. And Ken had, to some extent, stumbled across this story of a uh, bow fighter pilot uh, crew of two, so bow fighter pilot and his navigator who had died when their bow fighter um, flew into a ship in a fjord in Norway. And Ken was of the view that he'd stumbled across a story of great gallantry and he had used the process of the Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal to put this application for Hakewell to be recognised by the Victoria Cross. Um, I had the um, privilege of chairing the tribunal that reviewed that matter, um, and it was it was it was fascinating from so many angles. We had um, we had the story from the German side. We had the story from a gunner who was on the ship. We had the story from uh, post um, action reports from the Germans. We had a lot of input from uh, Norwegians who were. Uh, eyewitnesses, but now sadly deceased, uh, to the raid. We had some a couple of enthusiasts. That one was the son of an eyewitness uh, in Norway. Of course, we had the official RAF records. So these guys flew with 455, which was one of those brackets, RAAF. So it was an Australian squadron, but flying for the Royal Air Force. Um, the reason I mentioned them specifically is... Those, those records revealed nothing of this. They, they knew that, that James had died, but no one really knew what had happened. And so we had the, a uh, really good like detective challenge of figuring out what had happened. And when it was all done and dusted, uh, when I would uh, you know, uh, just engage with people socially about what, what the hell have you been doing, JQ, for the last whatever, uh, I would talk about this experience and say, you know, it's so brilliant, I really should write a book about that one day. And so that's what I did, got off my bum and wrote a book. Actually, we went to um, – it wasn't just that. The navigator's uh, parents uh, – again, a, a, a much richer story than I'll just cover here, but you know, the navigator's parents had trouble accepting that their son had died and they went to Norway in 1947 to try and figure it out. And while they were there, they mentioned to the Norwegians that they wouldn't mind erecting a memorial to their son. And so this granite memorial was put by the side of the fjord about where the bow fighter hit the ship. And um, the, uh, the habit in Norway on Norway's National Day 
you know, they don't have an Anzac Day parade or anything like that. But on Norway's National Day, they tend to gather in groups around memorials such as James Hakewell's, but also others that are dotted around the country. And they so they have had an annual gathering at the fjord in Ørsta, which was where the guys had died uh, every year since 1947. So that was the other thing I'd said to get, you know what? really should go to Norway and so I put my uniform in my bag and off I went and was a guest speaker and stuff it was fabulous yeah so recently you you just mentioned that you you write for the Air Force's History and Heritage Unit but you've recently written a book which you just mentioned Viking Boys and that would be a great podcast on its own to get you back on to talk about the book but can you give us just a little bit of an overview of the story and, and why why you felt that you had to write this book. Um, well, I suppose, look, let me cut to the chase. And the a, the end result of this, as I've suggested, you know, this was an application for James to be awarded the Victoria Cross. Um, at the end game, uh, let me preface my comments by saying that the the tribunal as it stood when I was working there, we were of the view or very conscious of the fact that what we were being invited to do was to change history, you know, okay? So make a decision that had not been taken at the time. Um, so we tended to be a, a little bit conservative, I guess, from that point of view in terms of, you know, did not want to be cavalier with our recommendations, right? Um, however... I was very excited when this case was first put before me because it sounded pretty damn good to me in terms of the argument that was being put. And so, indeed, if we could unpack this in James Hakewell's favour, I would not have hesitated to recommend him for a Victoria Cross. So we were able to get a long way uh, in in terms of uh, uh, unpacking the story to, towards understanding what had occurred back on the 5th of December, 44. But the thing that we could not get to was um, uh, intent or motivation, you know, those sort of personal reasons behind why this did occur. And at the same time, we were not able to determine that. You couldn't dismiss alternate theories, right? So there was a theory that said, and this was the, uh, the theory that supported the Victoria Cross, there was a theory that said that he had deliberately sacrificed his life so that the raid could progress unimpeded by this vessel that was putting up most of the anti-aircraft fire. Right? Okay, well, that's pretty good. However, equally, it could be said that uh, James had died because he was flying his vessel, he was flying his aircraft, right, in, in an attack on the vessel, um, firing uh, his cannon. He was not, they were rocket equipped and cannon equipped. He'd already released his rockets, but he was firing his cannon, so a forward firing weapon, um, which meant that to successfully hit the ship, he had to aim his aircraft at the ship. And so you could not dismiss the, the equally plausible theory that just said, you know what, he was, his aircraft was hit in the conduct of the attack, and because that's where the aircraft was pointed, that's where it hit. So, left with that dilemma, I'm not saying either of those is right, by the way. Um, All I'm saying is, I don't know. And because we didn't know, we couldn't make a recommendation. In fact, not, not, not only could we not make a recommendation for a Victoria Cross, we couldn't make a recommendation for any gallantry award because you just didn't know. So, better to leave it alone. But the, but the, the fact of what had occurred and the, um, the incredible bravery of the guys that were flying for Coastal Command in this campaign that, frankly, I knew nothing about before I start, was introduced to this. I just found it fascinating and I, found it was, I just thought it was a story that had to be written. So I reckon, I reckon I've probably done um, – <laughs> now it sounds like I'm full of myself, but I'm, I don't mean this in terms of the quality of my writing. That's for others to judge. But I reckon uh, by producing a book, that's probably a better outcome – um, for James Hakewell's memory than uh, achieving some sort of medallic recognition for a fellow who died in 1944, who leaves no kids, by the way. There's no family. I, I think, I don't think that's, I think that's a really, I think that's a really good 
way of you've put it because yes you've written a book and on it you're honoring his memory and and this book is will test the you know the test of time because you've written it and his story could have been one that was left in you know in the in forgotten about but you've brought it you've brought it to the to the front for people to to read and and understand and i can see where you would be it would be hard to you know like you said you can't definitively say yes it was a victoria cross action or he was just doing simply he was on mission he was doing his mission at at hand so i understand that there's there's no defense you you just want that little bit of evidence that was never there to say no it, it was a and like you're saying any gallantry award that you put up for or any the, the, and the Victoria Cross is one and I just recently did a podcast with Michael Madden who wrote uh, the VC Australia remembers and he uh, and I just interviewed him on Dasher Wheatley and the queen intervened with Dasher's citation because she wanted to make it absolutely clear that it was a Victoria Cross you know citation that was it, and she altered that citation and and the Victoria Cross, which you know because you've you've it's it's a it's a rigorous process that you have to go through to absolutely be certain that it is yeah. at the for, with the highest award. It's the highest award for valor. Like there's you yeah. know so I totally understand, and it would have been a a hard thing to to get to that point of going. Well, we'd like to give him the Victoria yeah. Cross, yeah. but it, we just there's not that evidence that is there. Exactly. And but as you say, the book is a it's a great, and I will definitely be getting you back on the podcast to talk about it early next year. So that that's one that we will be talking to you about. And and so, John, what advice would you give any young person who wants to be a fighter pilot in terms of school subjects to choose courses and developing other necessary skills? Um, oh look probably jump on the defence recruiting website for some of the technical stuff, but it's it's maths and science oriented. Um, but not not you don't have to be a scientist or a mathematician. You know, you just have to... Um, I guess it's more... You have to have an affinity for that sort of thinking, you know. So if you're just a Luddite at maths and science, probably forget it, you know. But if you've got... Um, if you can understand... Uh, scientific principles and mathematic principles and it's like geometry more than other fields of mathematics it's what is of what is of interest that relates back to navigation and the like and there's some some of those sort of principles um so certainly be aware of that and go for it the um there is a uh, I, I presume this would still be the case that the organization likes uh you know views candidates favorably that have managed to show uh, some substance to their interest, as in it's not just like I woke up this morning and thought, oh, I wouldn't mind being a fighter pilot today. No, there's been a, bit, a little bit more to it than that. And one of the ways you can do that is um, by uh, connecting with aviation if you can. And I know that this can be really difficult for some people, but, hey, I'm an example of, uh, you know, my mum really didn't have, you know, two pennies to scratch together when I was a kid, but I still managed to... Um, get uh, some powered flying under my belt through the Flying Scholarship of the Air Training course. I'd certainly commend um, that organisation, which is still active and out there, to anyone interested in that career. Um, but the the flying skill that I think is perhaps most valued is gliding, which might surprise you, um, but it's because it's such a fundamental stick and rudder discipline in flying a glider that it translates quite well to pilot training uh, in the Air Force. You know, some of the, uh, well, I say this out loud, but some of the training you might get at your local flying club doesn't necessarily translate all that brilliantly to the more uh, disciplined and the faster rate of learning that's required when you, you actually do get accepted and on course. So, and also too, is it an attitude as well? You've got to oh, have yeah. an attitude for it. Like yeah. it's, you... If you set your sights on being a fighter pilot, you've got to have a uh, – there's a, a discipline too, isn't there? There like is, a, yeah. And, you know, and there's this, you know what, just just try, try, try again, that sort of thing. Um, so don't be someone that gives up too early, you know. Just you – know, if that's what you want to do, make it so. I, I've met – look, 
two sides to that coin. I've met um, kids through my career, kids, that's anyone who's younger than me, right? Uh, I've met younger fighter pilots that have succeeded and got there through sheer bloody hard work and effort. I've certainly met others that have just drifted in because they're gifted, right? But I've but certainly seen the range, you know? So you can, you can flog your way there or you can be lucky and just have all the talent in the world that, that you know, the good Lord had gifted you and away you go. Um, however, the other side to that coin is um, there, are, there are plenty of people out there that would aspire to a career as a fighter pilot that frankly can't. And it's it's not it's not uh, attitude it's aptitude you know they just do not have the uh, whatever it is the motor skill the three dimensional perception and the like uh, to to get it and perhaps get it at the rate that you need to get it to satisfy as I said that fa- fairly fast progression that Air Force is looking for absolutely yeah what you said in the like it's great to have goals it's great to have yeah. ambitions and dreams and like yeah, some sometimes yeah, and I'm one that you know I spoke to you off air with this is that I know I didn't tell you this, but recently I applied for the Air Force and I actually failed my aptitude test. So and it was it was a big blow. It was a very big blow, and it 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 really hit me harder than what I thought. And and because I've always wanted to serve my country and yep. that dream, you know, it just it's not going. It's not going to happen so i've i've got to accept that and unfortunately it's it's been a hard pill to a uh, hard pill to swallow but you, you may not be in a position to um agree with me on this yet um but what i definitely do in in terms of advice in terms of what you've just told me it would my advice would be definitely do not let that deter you from giving it a go uh, because and the bit that you may not agree with is uh, yet uh, is that the fact of trying or the fact of giving it a go can open doors that you never thought would open because you've tried. That's true. That's very true. And and that that is true. And and I've actually been lucky, John, in a sense that I've had I've had a lot of veteran friends when I when I did say that I'd failed that that they would help me. Uh, try and achieve it and try and yeah so help me and tutor me and try and get me into you know doing what I what I've always wanted to do and and you know it's yeah as you say it's I've I'm already a winner for trying because a lot of people don't try so and and that's what it is so anyone out there try and uh, if you don't if you don't succeed try again and then and keep and exactly what John has said so John looking back now what is the proud proudest moment of your of your military career and would you change anything um no i don't think i'd change anything as i said it was a pretty good ride uh, the, <laughs> the the proudest moment of my career and there's been two of them identical is that i i have two sons and i got to pin the wings on both of them when they graduated as pilots in the Royal Australian Air Force. And i got to tell you, that was my proudest moment. Um, to bring that back to me, so to bring the question back to me, in terms of personalising what I am most proud of, I actually, we were talking before the podcast about um, the evolution of the Joint Terminal Attack Controller and Close Air Support, which is that's a, clearly those names rolling off my tongue. There's a big story. Um, but the, uh, the fact that I believe I've made a difference to my Air Force, I'm very proud of that in terms of shaping what uh, was to come. Um, and then I, I, I very much took... Terrific reward. I can still picture it in my head. So as a fighter combat instructor that was um, uh, in 77, I think at the time, and we were deployed to Malaysia and we were running a uh, a dogfighting program of uh, Hornets versus F-16s, which was always an interesting challenge, right? Because the F-16 could be a bit of a bloody handful. And I, I can remember one of the junior guys in the squadron coming to me just quietly t- taking me aside and saying JQ I'm really worried about this setup I'm not sure 
how how it's going to work. And so I was able to sit down with him and go, right, this is this is what I think you're going to see. This is what I think is going to happen. This is what he can do with his jet. This is what I think you should do with your jet. And um, and and then if you do that, if he does this, you do that, 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 that sort of stuff. And and uh, you you will succeed, right? Confident. Off you go, son. And he went. What, the thing that I can remember is the beaming smile on his face when he stepped back in the door where he'd done it, right? <laughs> and he'd shut the bloody F-16 down, you know. It was just uh, that uh, incredibly rewarding, yeah. So what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self if you could go back now, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self and would you change anything? Um, no, I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't. Um, yeah, maybe if I'd been a bit better at planning, I might have got some different outcomes. <laughs> as I mentioned, you know, and perhaps I wasn't as forward thinking as I should have been. But yeah, look, I've been uh, one of those people that's quite happy to go with the flow, and I. I I, uh, and I've just been incredibly blessed, you know, and now I find myself not through any grand design a- at all uh, enjoying writing, you know. So what, 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 what do I consider my career now in the main? Well, it's a new career as an author where I'm getting incredible reward uh, from writing and um, I would never have thought I had done that. So I'm pretty happy just to keep going with the flow. So... John, what are your plans? Obviously, you've just mentioned writing. Yeah, yeah, no, but your plans for the future with Kim and and family. Oh, right. Well, you know, um, uh, so I mentioned that both my boys ended up in the Air Force. Well, that's – so now um, Brendan, my oldest son, is a pilot with Qantas Link, so his career has moved on. My son Andrew is flying um, KC-30s at Ambly with 33 Squadron. Um, He's still got, you know, the messy – uh, career progression of postings here, there, and everywhere as he brings grandchildren into our life. Um, so you know, our, our plans. Look, I, I think we're 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 actually quite enjoying being settled in Newcastle, which is um, you know that's been quite a change to come to grips with the fact that we're settled. Um, quite enjoy that. I I, I I I dabble in a number of things. Kim dabbles in a number of things, and uh, we're very happy. Yeah. It's been. And I should say this, John, it's been an absolute honour and a privilege to come up to your house today in Newcastle and record this with you. And and I, I just want to say on behalf of all Australians, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service to our country. And thank you for everything that you do to remember the boys and, and, the, and the history. And we will definitely get you back on in the new year to talk about Viking boys and and when I've read the book I will uh, I will definitely get you back on to talk about the book and uh, I just want to say thank you John it's been an absolute honor and a privilege to have you on True Blue Conversations thanks Adam thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts and check out our new website True Blue History dot com for more great content.